All right, then, if you have your Bibles, we'd ask you to turn to the book of 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 8, and we're going to begin reading in verse 30. 1 Kings chapter 8, in verse 30. The Bible says, And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel, when they shall pray toward this place, and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, when thou hearest, forgive. If any man trespass against his neighbor, an oath to be laid upon him, cause him to, sw to swear, and the oath come before thine altar in this house, then hear thou in heaven and do. Judge thy servants condemning the wicked to bring his way upon his head, justifying the righteousness the righteous to give according to his righteousness. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy because they have sinned against thee and shall turn again to thee and confess thy name and pray and make supplication unto thee in this house, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy people Israel and bring them again to the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain, because they have sinned against thee, if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin when thou afflictest them, then hear from heaven and forgive. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your holiness and your graciousness. Lord, uh, we thank you for all the blessings that you bring our way. Lord, we pray that you'd allow us tonight to look back on what that you've forgiven us and that we may forgive others. Lord, that you'd look back and cause us to rejoice in the salvation that you gave and, see, and, and make us to see there's nothing pleasant about us either. Lord, we pray that forgiveness would come... Uh, Tonight, Lord, that you would save some, Lord, according to your mercy and grace, and that we might see the importance of forgiveness even one to another. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all, for it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, I'll be preaching this evening on the thought, the sweetest words. And we've all heard the song, the sweetest words I ever heard were I forgive. And, and I love that song, and, and it, it is the very basis of our salvation because without forgiveness, there is no salvation. Without uh, Him forgiving uh, the Lord God of heaven, the mighty God Jehovah, without he, the, the blood of His dear Son, there would be no forgiveness. There is always a price for forgiveness. There is always something that, uh, that, that pays for that atonement. And, and you know, uh, it never ceases to amaze me how we as the Lord's people uh, rejoice in our forgiveness, but then we don't forgive anybody else. We take malice and hate along with us wherever we go and then can't claim to be the Lord's own people. So going back to verse 30, uh, as, uh, and what is happening here, Solomon, Solomon is dedicating the temple. It is his prayer that this would be a holy place where God would meet with his people. He is dedicating the place to the Lord, and all through his prayer, he acknowledges that God's people will forget him. He acknowledges in each of his prayer that, that God, not, not when God, God's people would forget them, I mean, not if, but when. He knew the nature of man well enough that he knew the time would come where there would be uh, a time of forgiveness. And so he says, and hearken, he wants the Lord to listen, and hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant. Now, as he's beginning this prayer to approach God and invite God's presence on that place, the first thing he does is a prayer of supplication. And most of us do not even know what that is. When, we, when you uh, do a prayer of supplication, listen, it's not asking for a wish list. It's not asking for anything. When someone supplicates, it's simply praising God for who He is. It's lifting up His name high and holy. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. High and lifted up. Gracious is our Redeemer. How many of you done that even today? 
And I dare say most of us would have to say none. You know, it, it, it worries me about people that is able to carry around malice. It really does, because our Lord God uh, was not in the very least of that way. And so we see here as the dedication of the temple begins the prayer of dedication, he says, And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel. Now, did you get that? Not only was Solomon doing his job, the congregation was doing their job as well. Now, I ask you this evening, how much of that have you done? How much did you pray for me tonight before I got up to preach the, God, the Word of God? How much did you pray that the Lord might meet with us as a people? How, how, how much of that did you do before service time arrived? When they shall pray toward this place. Now, I want you to see that he was talking about the temple. He was talking about the, the place that they were at. And, and, and Jewish people still today face toward the temple. They face the east when they began to pray. That, that is their custom. Isn't it a wonderful thing that on the merit of the Lord, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ we can just pray. We don't have to look in a certain direction. We don't have to position ourselves. We can just pray. Uh, you know what? Uh, we watch it, and I, I'm not too much on Christian TV, but we watched a movie that caught my attention the other night, and it, it was really based on a closet of prayer because, you know, Psalm, uh, uh, the psalmist's advice was to uh, get in the prayer, and the Lord Jesus, too, to get in the closet and pull, pull the door shut, a private, quiet place to pray. Uh, and we, uh, we need to be more like that. We need to be individuals that have a real prayer life, not something uh, musical, not something whimsical, something that doesn't really mean much at all, but a real prayer life. Uh, you know what? Our God has not changed. What has changed is our attitude toward the God of the Bible. That's what's changed. And so we see in this place, He, he wanted Israel to be praying with Him. Then he says in verse 31, If any man trespass against his neighbor. Who's your neighbor? <laughs> you remember who said that? That's always our first thing. Who is my neighbor? Uh, you know what? We don't need any further explanation than that, do we? You look around this room tonight and you will see your neighbor. You, you, you look out from your front porch when you get back to the house, you'll see your neighbor. That we, we need to be a forgiving people to everybody we know. If you have an issue at a workplace, you need to be the one to forgive. If you have an issue at the church house, you need to be the one to forgive. If you have an issue in your family, you need to be the one to forgive. We need to speak the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know how churches get tore up? It's by people not forgiving. You can say, oh, uh, it's because uh, the devil got in the church and Sally did this and so-and-so did that. No, no, it was the lack of forgiveness. Well, I found this. When God's people get right and forgive like they should, Sally will leave if she's the problem. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's what I have found uh, to be the true case. And so we see then we as the Lord's people need to be in a mind of forgiveness. If any man trespass against his neighbor and an oath be laid upon him to cause him to swear, the oath come before thine altar in this house. Now, I'm going to throw something at you that has nothing to do with the sermon, but uh, you be very, very wary to place your hand on this book and swear to anything, including if you're in the court of law. When, 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 I, when I've had to give testimony, you know when I say, I say I promise to tell the truth. I'll do it to the best of my ability, but I ain't going to put my hand on the sacred book and say I swear anything. Uh, you better be very cautious of that. Now that was extra. You can think about that this week. Verse 33. When thy people Israel be smitten. Now he didn't say if you be smitten. It says when you are smitten. In other words, you're going to be smited. There are going to be individuals that come in your life and they will very deliberately cause problems for you when you are smitten. And you know what? In, to, in addition to individuals, churches get smitten too. 
They, they get slapped around a bit. You know what? Why should that be a surprise to us? Man, we get mad and get hurt quick. You know what? Our Lord Jesus Christ was, was slapped many times. In fact, he told, uh, when, when he stood before, uh, was it Herod? They slapped him because uh, he said, Thou hast said. He said, Art thou the Son of God? And he says, Thou hast said. And they slapped him. Then why shouldn't we do? Why shouldn't we turn the other cheek too? We look for problems. We we got to be very very cautious that we don't get into a state where we're not enjoying the Lord because of our own action. If any man trespass against his neighbor, and an oath be drop into verse thirty two, then hear thou in heaven and do judge thy servants, condemning the wicked to bring his way upon his head. And justifying the righteous to give him according to his righteousness. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, and shall turn again to thee, and confess thy name, and pray, make supplication unto thee in, in this house. Now I want you to tell, I mean I want to show you the Lord tells them a number of things that they have to do. Now, there's not a one of us under the sound of my voice that's not been smitten by the enemy. Now, if you'll read verse 33, that is the problem. The enemy had come against them. And in fact, the enemy had got the upper hand for a moment. How many of you have been in a situation where the devil had the upper hand? Where, where, he, where he was a little bit... In, now, I understand he's always under the authority of God, but listen... You can be under his authority too. He can push the right buttons. That, that's what the devil does best. And he says, he, so he says here, when my people Israel be smitten down before the enemy, your enemy is Satan. However he presents, if it's Polly Jane, if it's Jumping Jack, or whoever made it, remember your enemy is of the devil. He may be using anything, but your enemy is always Satan. And it always will be. When thy people be smitten before the enemy, why? Because they have sinned against thee. You say, oh, Brother Larry, I haven't done anything. Well, even in that, you've not justly said. Uh, we let God down every day, do we not? And they shall turn again to thee and confess thy name and pray. You know what the most difficult thing you will ever do is pray for someone you don't like. Now let's be honest, there's, all, there's always someone you really don't like. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, uh, we'd, be, we'd be lying if we didn't. There's been people, from the, and it might be me, but from the first time I met them, they just rubbed me the wrong way. You know what I need to do? I need to pray for them. I need to pray for them. And I really believe if we'll do that, God will be faithful to do His. We, he, he is the mighty God of heaven, is He not? Do, do you not believe if you'll go that with some sincerity? The people, uh, and, and I'm not going to say anything, but my wife will know who I'm talking about. There's an individual that just rubs me the wrong way, and most things I would do very differently than this individual, but the best thing I can do is to pray for that person. Yeah. Yeah. That's the best thing I can do for I'm not going to say who it is, but uh, that, that, that's the situation. And I have to remind myself and I have to bite my tongue so that I don't say something that I'll regret. Because you know what? It may be that I might be a witness to this person one day. And how could I possibly witness if I just blew a gasket and, and, and said something outside the little God? You know what? The Lord saved me. I've been saved, I guess, 35 years. We'll be in June. I blew gaskets a lot of times. And... Now going back and talking to those people, it's a difficulty. It really is. Uh, uh, and so we see, we see then that we need to understand and know that it impacts us with the Lord, not just with those individuals. Verse 34. Then hear thou in heaven and, for the, and forgive the sin of thy people. Now I want you to see Solomon puts it here in a corporate situation. The nation of Israel, the whole group of individuals, you know what? You're affecting me even tonight. 
And, and the thing that is, I'm affecting you. The thing that we need to remember and understand that uh, the Lord's the Lord's church is a, like a body fitly formed together. A, a lot of times people say, well, you know, the pastor is the one that needs to keep everything fit. No, no. That, that, that can't be. I'm just a piece of this body. And if I have malice or contempt or upset with somebody, yes, it's my responsibility. But you know what? I'm not in the business of choosing sides. Now, if, it, if it's over the Word of God, you bet you I'll go with that book. But we need to understand and know that we are in the will of God. And listen, a big fight, it, unless you're defending the Word of God, there, there's no reason for it. Verse 35, when heaven is shut up and there is no rain. Now, we know what drought here is in Tennessee. We had some a couple of years ago. My wife enjoyed it greatly. Um, but if you had a spiritual drought, I, I would have to say every one of us have experienced spiritual drought. Oh, yeah. Right? You say, I don't know, Brother Larry. Well, if you haven't, you will. And my guess is that you have and you didn't know it. Spiritual drought is when you're not hearing a, a, a little drought. We're not getting anything from heaven, right? Uh, when we have no nourishment for our grass, our vegetables, whatever we need. When you're in a spiritual drought, you're not hearing from God. And, and we desperately need that today. If we, if anything, and, and I really believe, and I know I've heard this for nearly 50 years, uh, uh, as Justin pointed out the other day, I'm nearing the big 5-0. And uh, I understand that. I've heard it all my life. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. But I'll say this. All I know is He's 47 years closer than the day I was born. And in that time, the only way we're going to stand out it's by the help of each other. Man, it's good. Uh, that, a lot of people don't like that. But you know what? It's very true. And you know what? It may go a lot, and, and we better be in a position to pray. How can you pray for someone when you don't even like them? Yeah. And it may go a lot further than that. Listen, you, you look around the building tonight. Uh, many, many of us <laughs> are, are, are only years. If the government shuts down, you think about how much money in this church is shut down just because the government's no longer issuing Social Security. <coughs> you know what? We'll need each other then, will we not? <laughs> Bring things down like they used to be, wouldn't it? When heaven is shut up and there is no rain, why? Because they have sinned against thee. So the next time you get this big idea that you've arrived and, and you know better than everybody else, remember your remarks are not against that person, they're against God. Unless you're defending truth, your attitudes and your remarks about another person Really, yeah. And, and if you can't think about it any other way, think about this. It's impacting your relationship with Christ, is it not? That's right. And if it's impacting your relationship with Christ, what could be more valuable? The, the honor of man, the praise of man, the honor of man, or the honor of God? Which do you want? I'd much, much, much rather be in the will of God and I'm going to take my position wherever it may be and have the presence of God with me. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against thee, if they pray toward this place and confess my name and turn from their sin, when thou afflicts, afflictest them. Now I want you to see, he gives us a measure of the cure. First of all, again, I'm, I thank God we don't have to face the east anymore. But we do have to turn toward God. <coughs> you know what? There's not a one of us under the sound of my voice tonight that didn't ever have a place that they needed to repent. Turn toward God. That's what, that's what repentance means, is turning from. And when we get so into 
bad-mouthing other people and running people down. You know what? You don't have time to praise God when you get so caught up in that. And whatever your circumstance is, if you're a student, if, you, uh, if you're a preacher, or if you're a housewife, or if you're a child, when all you think about is running someone else down, listen, the devil's got you in the handbasket. That, that, that's the truth. And when we can do nothing but, but dwell on that, there is a problem somewhere. So our Lord Jesus very much gives us uh, a, a wonderful solution. Then uh, He tells us, if they pray toward this place and confess my name. You know what? When you bring Jesus into the equation, everything else just levels out, does it not? Confess my name. You say, you know what? Well, I don't, I don't like... Uh, uh, I don't like Bobby Dean because he does this and I do that. You know what? What does Christ do? Get him into the equation. What Bobby Dean thinks about won't matter much anymore. Right? Yeah. And so the first thing, confess his name. Do you confess the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? They called them Christians first in Antioch. And you know why? They were Christ-like. Is it Christ-like to carry around the grudge? Is it Christ-like... You know what? That, that baggage will kill you. That hate and malice and she did this and he said that and did you see how their kids was dressed? You drag that around long enough it'll kill you. Absolutely. What we need to do is just be more concerned about Jesus and less concerned about what the worst of the rest of the world is thinking about us and focus in on, on uh, worshiping the Lord. And then he says... And turn from their sin. You say, well, Brother Larry, it's not my problem, it's theirs. It's easy to say, isn't it? Turn from our sin. You know what? If we have malice and contempt, that's sin, is it not? If all we can do is stand and think back about what someone else has done to them in a wrong way, that's sin, isn't it? The sweetest words I ever heard where I forgive. Now when you think about that, that the great God Jehovah and His dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, have one reason to forgive me. No. I was against them in every way. Came forth from the womb speaking lies. But they still said, I forgive. Before I even knew what forgiveness was, it was good as already done. So how could we do any less? How could we possibly drudge up things from the past when, when, when the very best example forgave us everything before we even knew it? And certainly that's what we should strive to be as well. Verse 36. Then... After you've done this, after this has been completed, nationally, as a church, or individually, after that's done, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people in uh, Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk. Now, did you get that? Once forgiveness is established, you're in the right place. And they may be doing most anything else, but what you're doing is praying for them. You're not worried about what's going on over there because your mind is on Jesus. You don't even see what their problem is anymore because you're in your closet somewhere praying. When you get like that, you know what? You're in, you're in a position then to be blessed. And what i found is when I get my prayer life, uh, my prayer life where it needs to be, that's such a big job. I don't have enough, I don't have enough time to worry about Sally right. Jane. I knew that. Yeah. Forgiveness is where we need to be. Amen. You, you, wanna, you know, I've thought for years and years, and Brother Downs and I have talked about this a number of times, uh, why God doesn't send revival like He once did. Well, I believe it's because we're carrying around a, a lot of trash. And I, when I say that, I don't mean, I don't mean necessarily mean worldliness. I mean contempt and hate. Spite for other people. For people that's even in the same body of Christ where we abide can't stand them. Where's room for that? Where's room for that in this book? Are there going to be people that push you the wrong way? You betcha. Identify them and pray for them. 
I don't like to say names when I'm being recorded, so I won't. But there was an individual that used to run a junkyard, and he pushed my buttons. And you know what I did? First couple times, I, I shot back at him. And it wasn't very long. Don suggested we just get somebody to pick the trash up. And that's what we did. You know why? I didn't have to look at him then. Didn't have to talk to him. And that's where we need to be. That's where we need to be. Now, I, won't, I have to say this, and uh, we're about to close. I don't know that I ever got in the condition to pray for him like I should have. And now he's dead. Leave you with regrets, don't you? It'll leave you with regrets. Verse 37, if there be any in the land, famine, if there be pestilent, blasting, mildew, locusts, or in there be a caterpillar, if their enemy besiege them in the land of their cities, whatsoever plague, whatsoever sickness there be, what prayer and supplication soever be made by any man or by all thy people Israel, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart and spread forth his hand toward this house, then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and do and give to every man according to his ways, thou <laughs> whose heart thou knowest, for thou, even thou alone, Knowest the hearts of all the children of men. Now, as Solomon's ending, nearing the end of his prayer, he acknowledges one thing in verse 38, that God knows. He knows the heart. You know what? I can fool you pretty good. Uh, recently at work, and I'm going to try to get it done when I get home, they want to copy my transcript where I graduated college. And uh, they've asked about it twice, and I just forget to do it. And it's a complicated process on the internet. And, but I thought, you know, why do they want that? <coughs> well, it kind of came to me on the way home. They don't know that I have that degree. Huh. I told them I did. And I have a piece of paper that says I do, but they don't know that I have it. And in the same way, we can say just about anything. Mm -hmm. But you don't know the way it is. That's right. You may say, hey, everything's all right. I'm happy as a daisy and glory to God. Everything's fine. And you may be carrying around a bunch of muck. Because you can tell me anything. I'm not an easy person to fool. I mean, I'm an easy person to fool. You know, I, 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 my wife has said I'm way too trusting. And I probably am. So I'm easy to fool. But you know what? God's not. God's not easy to fool. He knows you inside and out. He knows, he knows you better than you know yourself. Yeah. And so we as the Lord's people then ought to be thrilled at the thought of forgiveness. It ought not to be hard. And you know what the sad truth is this? As I look at individuals, it is the hardest thing sometimes for God's people just to simply say, I forgive you. Just carry around stuff that just doesn't matter. In the light of time and eternity, what really matters? I'll say this, one thing matters, and that's the destiny of a never dying soul. That's all that matters. So if she looked at you crosswise, crossways, or if he turned his head and wouldn't speak to you, what does that possibly mean in time and eternity? It means nothing. It means less than nothing. What really is mean is spreading the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What really is important is telling one more person that there's a man named Jesus that shed out his life's blood for the sins of his people. What more could you want to do? And how do you bear his name with contempt in your heart? You know what? You won't do it. You may go through the motions, but you won't do it. You know, you've all heard as a sounding brass and a tingling cymbal. That's about how you come across. We, we, need, we need power in our lives. We need power in our churches. And it starts with forgiveness.
we uh, be a good thing to go before the Lord and ask forgiveness of ourselves and then go before others and ask their forgiveness. I've said this many times before and I'll say it one more time because I think it's very appropriate. Brother Downs' first wife, everybody remembers Sue. And I think she would fall, call, fall in the category of what my mother would call a spitfire. She, uh, you didn't have to wonder very long about what she thought, because she'd tell you. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, she, she didn't necessarily uh, have a way with words. You knew what she meant when she was done, but it wasn't necessarily the, the, the kindest way to present it. But you know what impressed me about Sue? When the Lord truly saved her, I went down to Brother Downs the next morning, and I really didn't know the Lord had saved her. I'd gone down there to check on her. And she was on the phone calling me saying, listen, the Lord saved me, and I've got, I, I carry dislike for you in my heart, and I want you to forgive me. I tell you what, a, a woman nearly 65 years old to only say, would you forgive me, man, that, that shouting around, it ought to be. That's what we need to be. We need to be, hey, you know what, it, it was my fault. Would you forgive me? Even if she was the one, if he was the one that threw the first blow. Say, hey, you know what? It was my fault. I, I, I'm sorry. Could you forgive me? And then if you did that, you get in the closet. Don't worry about it.